the moderator for this evening. Um, so is there the pigeonhole yeah. slide? Okay, so uh, some of you have already submitted questions to the pigeonhole here. Uh, before we get into in the introductions and, and everything, just a reminder, uh, if you have questions, do submit to the pigeonhole. Uh, feel free to vote up questions that are already there if, if you would like them to be prioritized. Um, yeah, so I, I think we'll start off by having a round of introductions first. So take it away. Uh, hi, everyone. So we all can hear me. Where this? Okay, test, test. Hey, uh, I'm Linda. I joined a boot camp about three years ago. Uh, that was Trend Global College. And uh, shortly after that, I applied for the TFIP program. So um, I got in, uh, went for another three months of training. Then, um, then I started on-job training with DBS Bank. And uh, I was just converted last year. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Hui Tian. I'm a career switcher. Uh, I used to do uh, arts, uh, basically like game artists and illustration. Then I joined the ThoughtWorks Bootcamp about three to four years ago and then have been working afterwards in the in industry ever since. Yeah. Okay. Hey, hi, everyone. I'm Gabrielle or Gabby. And I went to a boot camp called General Assembly in around 2016. Then after that, I was a software engineer for a while at a startup. And then I decided that, OK, maybe I should go to university. So I did a CS degree. Uh, but however, it was disrupted by the pandemic. So that got cut short too. Um, then I came back to Singapore, spent some time outside of tech. Uh, so doing a non-profit, but also during that time, caregiving. And then now I'm back in tech uh, as a solutions architect. Uh, you, you can keep that. <laughs> okay, so I, yeah, do share that. Um, yeah, so it's my turn. Uh, I was a teacher for a while. Then I went to the Ministry of Education. Then I decided, you know, uh, life's too short to stay in one job forever. Uh, did a mid career switch. I went for General Assembly boot camp. Um, back then it was called Web Development Immersive. I think this was back in 2018. Uh, since then, I've been a software engineer, uh, stock exchange, and now and I'm at GovTech. Yeah, so that's that's me. Um, so before we launch into the Q&A, um, we'd like to know a bit about the audience. So hands up if you are currently in a boot camp. Uh, recently graduated from boot camp. Great. So very relevant. Um, looking for a job? Recruiters? <laughs> the, the chance right yeah okay uh so cool i i think we can launch straight into it because i just looking at the questions here i, I get a sense that um uh, many folks are anxious or um looking for answers about what to expect when they transition into a, a tech job especially if you're a mid-career switcher or you come out from the boot camp and wondering you know uh how is this going to go for me? You know, there are so many other people, you know, trying for this. So let's see. Let I, I suppose let's start off with a question that's quite relevant to this. If you are starting off uh, looking for a job, then it's quite likely that you are going through an interview process. So yeah, how was your interview process like? And how long did it take for you guys to land a full-time position as a boot camper? Um, did you have to learn? Self-learn algos or leak code or hacker rank questions to land a position. Okay. Uh, my interview process, because um, it's part of the TFIP program, so there was a technical interview and an assessment. So I did have to self-learn uh, algos or leak code. Uh, I, I did uh, bite-sized um, questions. So there's this site called Adderbit. So it helped me a lot because it's bite-sized and there are different ranks. Um, it, it ranges from um, very easy to very difficult. So I think that helped a lot. So um, the process took about, I think, about two, three months to from the start of, the, of applying to being accepted. And uh, the 
interview process uh, it was very pleasant the um the interview interviewers ask about uh, previous ex experience and uh, what you can bring to the table so what makes you stand out so yeah i think we'll talk about that later but um yeah it was a pleasant uh, experience for my okay that was quite a while ago um i took i think a few months before i land a job after the uh i graduated but at that point of time i think the um industry was kind of different in the sense that there were more jobs so i had a few job offers and then uh, I, I could like pick and choose um but in preparation for that uh i also had to uh like do lead code hacker ranks i think that's like probably part and parcel of most people's experience and then um like there's like a, there's a bunch of stuff that uh like based on other people's recommendation i also pick uh like pick up uh. so for instance there was cracking the coding interview sicp all those kind of stuff so in a way i think um i'm not sure how it will differ in terms of the uh time frame now but um the interview process back then was actually it was in a way it was also very tiring because there was a lot of uh coding exercises so there are companies who ask you oh can you send this like uh, by next week and then i had like a few line up and i had to tell them oh can i ask them because uh i sent a bunch like because at the start you're like oh i i think i will not get any so just like send a whole bunch of um applications and then when it comes back then you have like, a whole bunch of exercises to do yeah so uh that's something that i had to manage also uh. Okay, uh, I have interviewed several times in different capacities, such as the bootcamp grad, also a uni grad, also uh, coming back from non-tech to tech person. Uh, so I would say each of, I, I don't remember the times, like to me, I think I just kept applying. Uh, but what I will share is the three different types of interviews that I had. So yes, there's like the lead code kind, uh, which I do not like. <laughs> Um, the second kind is a live whiteboarding. So in fact, they don't really, they, they say, la, maybe it's not this. They say that, oh, you don't have to get the right answer. You just need to explain how you, what your thinking style is. <laughs> I see you shaking head. So maybe that's why I didn't get the job. I don't know. Um, the third kind is the portfolio kind. So they give you a brief and then you get, either get a few days, one week build it out, come back with, to them with the project. And also the one more kind is just to look at your portfolio and like ask you to explain your thought, uh, thought process behind it. So whether the question, do I have the self-learned algos? My short answer is that there, there are many kinds of interviews and each one has a different requirement. So that's, uh, I think these responses are all uh, coming from the point of view from before the interview and during the interview. Um, but I think there's also some curiosity about uh, that knowledge from doing all this lead code stuff and learning the algos and data structures. Um, do you feel that your career advancement might be hindered if you don't have that knowledge? Do I feel that my career advancement will be hindered? Um, it's definitely important. Uh, I would strongly emphasize uh, the importance to grind lead code, hacker rank, and um, build up your foundation. Because uh, let's say you started off uh, with a shaky foundation in your job, you'll find that you need it. So all these are building blocks, and uh, it will definitely help uh, in your critical thinking, in uh, making decisions. Yeah. For me, I think it depends. Um, I have friends who went into front end and then they just want to be like specialized in front end. And I think the kind of stuff that um, will help advance your career, it depends on um, what is needed in your career path. So there, there are different stuff that's required. But if you want to be a good software developer, then I think learning the fundamentals is essential. So uh, in terms of lead code, right, it's like basically I no longer like do like questions upon questions or questions of lead code. But then the fundamentals of like, oh, knowing that uh, how to calculate the uh, 
time-space complexity, this is still relevant. Uh. Yeah. Nothing to add. Very good. Thank you. But then, um, yeah, so that's about, I, I suppose, the stuff about lead code, algos, and stuff like that. Um, but I, I believe just now, uh, Gabriel mentioned about portfolio interviews, right? So there's, a, there's an interesting question here about, you know, um, see that flashes up. What kind of portfolios uh, would stand out in an, in an interview? Yeah, okay, it's, it's showing. Okay. Uh, to be honest, I think anything you build that, that you can explain the whole design process of why you made the certain decisions, whether it, uh, that, would, that will really stand out. It's not so much the product, like you can build the most jazzy, fancy thing, but like if you don't have the top process behind it, then it, it really shows true. Lah. Whereas the most basic, simple thing, like even I think one of my project was like a Sudoku. Oh no, tic tac toe. I know. <laughs> like first week of boot camp, right? We had to build the tic tac toe. Wow, that one was the most like difficult task at that point, right? But then I I really went in that. I remember one of my first few interviews, uh, which I started interviewing halfway through the boot camp just to like test the water, right? So I got nothing else to show. So I showed okay, I showed tic tac toe. But then I just explained like the different logic of like what my thinking process was. Mm -hmm. um, of course, in further interviews, it will get more complex. But I, I, the point being that if you can explain the end-to-end -end design decisions, I think that will stand out. All right. So far, I think that's um, about the interviews. Uh, there was another question here about I need to rephrase this. How, how do you present yourself to the uh, employers during the interviews? There's actually a bunch of questions about this, I, I think. So we feel that they're all underlying. I mean, underlying it is a question of, um, as a bootcamp grad, how should you present yourself? Um, what advantages do you have or might not have? How do you feel about that? Anyone? Um, during my interview process, I think uh, the HR and the interviewer already know that um, uh, I'm a mid-career changer. So I guess they lower their expectations. But uh, uh, aside from that, um, they were interested in knowing what I did previously. So example, when I um, talked about my... Um, I came from an arts background. Uh, I was a video editor for a long time. So uh, when I talked about that and they were interested to see if there's any parallels between that uh, in, in, into transiting to be a uh, software developer. So um, for my manager, he could see that, okay, uh, so I'm, I'm more inclined towards uh, the front end side. So something that's visual and um, the flow of uh, like uh, clicking the button will uh, show up another page. So uh, everything is more visual and uh, I'm, I will be more particular about the spacing and uh, the alignment. Uh, so there are some parallels. So, um, so uh, I talked a lot about that and uh, that got me in, yeah. Yeah, for me similarly, I also came from like a uh, arts background. So uh, I think one thing that helps is you sell yourself based on your uniqueness. Because each of us like, um, if we just check the paper qualifications, that's um, probably just part of the story. Lah. And uh, there's also another part, which is um, I tend to look for employers where I think I can add value to. So um, I, uh, for my first job, I look at startups uh, where I was interested in. And then um, I think that my skills could be um, useful to them. So I did some uh, UI stuff previously. And then uh, a lot of the times um, when they talk to me and then they, they say like, um, the interviewers are like, oh, uh, here's our uh, UX. And then um, like there is like um, impression that uh, if you come from a design background, then perhaps you can speak the same language to the UX artist. Uh, the other thing is like some of the um, jobs that I interviewed for was also uh, veering towards the uh, like front end uh, US background because I think I could pivot myself in that manner. Yeah, that point is so true on like each of us have our unique point and superpower, right? So while we try to like sell on the 
tech skills, but what we're really, all the problems that we're solving is really not tech problems, it's like world problems, human problems, and it's so much more than just the tech problem. So I, I think like my point that I really want to sh emphasize is that all the experiences you've had really is valuable and can bring something to the table to your future employers, to yourself as well. Um, so yes, how this came into play, like I think in my boot camp, we were the second batch of GA. So you have this bunch of people who didn't really know what GA was, came from very different um, backgrounds, also didn't know what the boot camp was supposed to do. Um, but then after, after I saw that, let's, let's say they came from the medical background, they went on to work on medical stuff, not necessarily full on tech, but combining their previous domain or, and with the tech domain really is, is very, very valuable. So yes, uh, bootcamp grads, I think were actually very, very valuable in that we can see many angles, many different domains and combine all that together. Hang on, I'm trying to find something that has disappeared here. <laughs> tech, right? Yeah, this happens all the time in tech. I uh, don't do, don't do live code demonstrations if you can. <laughs> No, stuff is just going in. So uh, while we're waiting, I'll share a story. So uh, for the TFIP program, I, I had another interview uh, with another financial institution. And uh, for when he heard that I did media, uh, for a major part of the interview, he was asking me, uh, am I interested in making a corporate video for them? I was like, huh? <laughs> You're not asking me about code or you know technical in, uh, questions, but uh, you know uh, he was talking about uh, what kind of story can we sell and you know the whole concept about making a corporate video. So yeah, so you never know uh, uh, from your previous experiences, uh, your interviewers may be looking out for something else or something uh, along with your um, coding skills? I think Linda is better at this than I am, since she's answered the question before I found the question. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but basically, the next question is this, uh, uh, which you know, is how, how did your previous uh, job experience help you in interviews? This one, I think my previous job was quite different. So my previous job, um, meaning pre Pre boot camp, uh, I guess this one probably the question isn't asking about uh, the tech job side, uh, changing from a tech job to another. Uh, so I was mostly drawing. Um, I don't really know if that helps in the interview, but um, the stuff that does help is by selling myself like based on like oh uh, I used to be um, like talking to clients and then um, these are the like the soft skills that I learned. And um, there are some misconceptions that they have uh, about, um, let's say, an artist. And then having to basically, uh, for some interviewers, like, walk them through like, uh, what my previous job actually was like. Because, uh, for instance, one, my, my first job was uh, at a, a game studio. So there was also uh, programmers and there was artists. So in a way, it's like uh, like uh, we did do a version of agile. It's just not called agile. Yeah. So that kind of helped when um, like my first job was like, oh, uh, I, by the way, we practice agile here. Do you know? Have you heard about agile? I have heard about it, but I didn't practice it. But I could relate it from my other jobs. Huh? Yeah. So that kind of helped. Mm. Yeah. Uh, I had. So I'll talk about two experiences. Uh, one is also this exact agile thing. So I was like searching for a job in Canada because I was studying there at that time and I was looking for a contract job. Uh, so unknown to me, like they, we were brought into a room and then like everyone else was interviewing for a full-time role whilst I was still a student. So I was also very confused. But in the end, the thing that they were specifically looking for was um, someone who had experience with Agile and not so much the tech coding, but they just wanted to influence the whole team to move towards Agile. So there was one, exp uh, one experience that uh, the previous experience helped me in the current job. 
Um, the second one that I'll share would, uh, goes into a bit more about what I'm doing now. So I know there are some questions about what is a solutions architect and all that. Um, so if I could describe it in two or three sentences, um, a solutions architect um, owns the business outcome but, but translates that into the technical outcomes and really owns the end to end from like requirements to development to delivery. So the in terms of the main difference is who I'm working with instead of just code and like the monitor all day is a lot of people, uh, customer facing, people facing and with the dev teams. Um, yeah. So how did my previous experiences help? To be honest, um, alluding to the tool, the, the idea that um, coding or these algorithms are just tools, right? So there's this idea of we have a toolbox and all these things are tools. So my previous experience in the non-tech role actually, so like in non-profit of like running administration, legal finance, governance, um, helps a lot in the actual job now. Um, not to say that the tech is not important, but all these are really tools that help me solve the overall problem. Yeah, so I, I think after talking about um, previous job experience and how it helps um, in our actual jobs, um, it's quite an interesting question here, which I think we have to be honest sometimes. Uh, it's about discrimination. Actually, there are a few of these questions here. So do we have, have we faced any discri discrimination uh, coming from boot camps and applying to these jobs, right? So we've spoken a bit about the differences in education, but actually on the ground, yeah, did we face any discrimination as a boot camper? Uh, to be honest, um, so me and another classmate, we are the first batch of boot campers that my manager hired. Uh, we didn't uh, face any discrimination. Um, so, uh, and on top of that, actually, they were more curious about us, about our roles, since we didn't come from the traditional um, university um, degree background, yeah. I only had one experience where I think the interviewer uh, had a form of stereotype or discrimination about the bootcamp uh, graduates. Uh. And I suspect the HR was like, okay, just, just send to him. But then um, in general, uh, most likely if you send out the applications, whoever reply, it's kind of self-selecting because if they see that you are a bootcamp graduate, they, are, they still interview you. They are using their resources to interview you. Most likely they, are, uh, they would like to hire a bootcamp graduate. So that particular one experience, it was like a lot of like, oh, so what do you all learn? And then is it sufficient? And then uh, a lot of these questions, which in a way, I don't think I could have convinced that, that person, even if I were to ace the test anyway. Yeah, so that one is, uh, I think um, there is, but uh, in terms of landing a job, uh, you will have to make sure that your knowledge is sufficient. Okay, I have a data-driven way of <laughs> to this answer. So, but mind you, the context was this was 2016, the first few boot camps in Singapore, second batch. So no one even like heard of the boot camps at that point. Uh, so I, I applied to 40 companies. I remember I have my Excel and there was a very distinct split between like uh, companies that were a bit more, I don't want to say Singaporean, but traditional. And they straight out like rejected me versus those that were a bit more like Western startups and they gave me a chance at least to interview. Um, so of in the end, I, I admit to like cold emailing the CEOs on national day, 6 a.m. Like <laughs> I got a few interviews that way, but in the end, I did have a few handful and I uh, joined a startup that was a bit more Western in thinking. Um, but that said, I don't, I wouldn't say this was discrimination. Um, it's really just, yeah, you just show what you have. Don't take it personally. On the flip side, I will share that after I went for the CS degree, and I also have friends who graduated top from this uh, really good university CS degree, but also struggled to get jobs. So is that, I mean, I wouldn't call that discrimination, right? So let's, uh, I, I think all my approach is really just focus on what you can control, like whether what they think about bootcamp or not, you can't control, but focus on the, the skill sets and what you've built to, to share with them. 
yeah, uh, I suppose about this discrimination thing, um, think about it, most of the, if, if I think about my own experience, most of the software engineers I work with don't actually have CS degrees. Um, I don't think all of us have CS degrees here either. And a CS cohort is only that big per year. So if you only rely on CS graduates for software engineers, uh, you're not going to have very much software in the world, basically. Um, there is another discrimination related question here, which uh, I won't be able to contribute anything to. So let's, uh, let's check it out. <laughs> How do you navigate a male dominated industry as a woman? Take it away. Okay. Um, I think this is a easy question, at least for me, uh, for my circumstance, because uh, in my broader team, it's actually half half. Yeah. So um, I maybe cannot answer the question as as uh, someone who worked in a more uh, um, with a, you know a different ratio between the men and the women. <laughs> my team is also half half. <laughs> My previous team is also half <laughs> half. So, so actually, that means we are getting more uh, more women in the workforce. I, I think it also depends on what kind of company uh, you end up choosing. Uh. Uh, my first job was a fintech company that is very male dominated with very finance bros kind of like culture. <laughs> but the, the issue isn't really so much like, um, in a sense, it's like, I think it's very rare that you get like straight out discrimination. Um, it's more of like, sometimes it's like microaggression and you're not very sure whether they are treating you that way because you're a woman or is it because you're not good enough. Uh, but in, within my first team, it's like uh, apart from like very certain individuals, most of the colleagues that I interacted with were um, like, they were egalitarian, they were, they were nice and um, there was no issue working with them. Uh. So in a way, it, if, it is a work thing, then it's more of like maybe um, you have to look at what company you are working for. Uh, in terms of the wider industry, I guess I don't really know because um, the only benefit that I for instance, uh, just now we were discussing, right? We, went, we go to conference and then uh, the, the female toilet is always empty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But other than that, it's like, um, I think applying for jobs, uh, so on and so forth, actually, most of the time, your gender isn't really uh, uh, like a, that much of an issue. Yeah. Okay, so I wasn't that privileged. <laughs> uh, so my first few jobs were de definitely more males. I mean, meaning the females were like a handful out of like maybe five to 20 ratio. And also I can talk about like CS classes, both in a local uni, which I attended for some time and overseas. It was also about like five girls in the whole room of like 100 guys. Um, but that said, I think my approach was just like, this something that no one can change. Not like, yeah, so just focus on what can be done, which is really learning. Um, in terms of work now, I, I do also see it sometimes play out. Like let's say I'm the technical person going in with the salesperson, uh, but the customer might sometimes assume that the technical person is the male. But again, yeah, just nothing that can be changed. So just, just yeah, do, I mean, deliver what I am committed to. But I will share that for the, the call out for the males is that I have had really good um, role models and allies in all these workplaces despite the, the imbalance and they have really made it like possible to succeed or thrive um, for, uh, by them like pushing, encouraging me, uh, pushing me to like do things that I typically wouldn't dare to do. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, if there's something y'all can do and yeah, your part to play. I wonder about our experiences of uh, like workplaces having half-half uh, gender ratio. Like, uh, is it a more recent thing? Because one of the questions here, if it comes up, is about um, not having senior female engineers to look up to or aspire to be. Like, has that been your experiences in your companies? Um. 
there there is um there are f senior female engineers um at the in the team I work for, and also uh, two of the team leads out of five are female. So, uh, yeah, they they are my role models. <laughs> there you go. Okay. In my previous team, I had a uh, senior female engineers that I can look up to and uh, ask for advice on for from. Then currently, I think in my current team, uh, we don't have like senior female leads uh, for engineer side, uh, which I think is quite common because if I were to observe, right, actually female senior engineers that have been in the industry for longer, I think that is lesser. Right? But things are changing. So hopefully um, this, this gender disbalance um, will slowly over time improve. Yeah, nothing to add. Uh, similar startup with no very few, but it's increasing, so that's really good, and that's why we have groups like this. So, yes. Actually, yeah, just to add, also, <laughs> I guess I I realize like okay, we also don't need to just limit ourselves to our workplace, uh, because I guess like one way is like events like this, then we network, and then um, perhaps we can have like uh, meet more other female engineers. Yeah. Yeah, and there'll be a networking event later. So if you have uh, questions that are really specific to, uh, to one of them, uh, feel free to ask later. Um, so I think we can mark this as... Uh, hang on, there's a comment here. Uh, are they famous? Okay, I don't think that's so relevant. Right, uh, let's move on to the next one, which is this. I think this is a rather common question as well. Um, this whole thing about imposter syndrome, uh, have any of you faced it? Uh, how do you deal with it as a mid-career switcher? Uh, definitely. Um, imposter syndrome is very, very strong and very, very real. And uh, just to share, when I uh, first started in my role in, in, the, in my company, um, yeah, there were mild panic attacks. But then I think it's much of it uh, is I mean now looking back it's uh, self imposed. So I think I think um, yeah, having the hindsight now, um, it's it's good to set uh, realistic expectations and also um, lower your own expectations. Yeah, because sometimes it's all just uh, in our heads, you know. Yeah. Uh, for me, I guess I. One story was that like in my first job, uh, there was like this 360 peer review thing. And then we had to, for some reason, also estimate our own performance. <laughs> and then I severely underestimate my own performance to the point where my uh, uh, my lead called me into the room and I was like, are you okay? Uh, <laughs> because your performance is actually very good. Uh, but your expectation of yourself, I think, is like um, not... Uh, in line with what we think. So, so they had to assure me that like, oh, like basically I'm doing well and that um, those mistakes that I thought was like, oh, it's like very big. It's actually part and parcel of an engineer's career. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. It's so cool. Um, yes, on that point, like mistakes is part of an engineer's career. I think that's one thing that helped. Like knowledge is really just the sum of our mistakes, right? So yeah, it's okay to make mistakes. Um, I definitely did not understand or embrace that. And I really struggled with this so much so that I thought the solution was to quit my job and go to university. Uh, TLDR, so to save you the pain, no, university does not make you suddenly magically like <laughs> a lot more knowledgeable. Um, in fact, it makes you more aware of how much more you don't know. So there's, I don't think there's any point where where we we're like, okay, I know everything, um, and we just have to get comfortable with that fact. Um, now working at a very large company with a lot of supposed, okay, they are very experts, but I also realize that each expert is really an expert in their own like feel, right? Which is this like feel, uh, this sliver. So I think, yeah, it just helped me get used to the fact that, okay, no, no one knows everything. I don't have to know everything. And how we learn is to make mistakes and we can ask others for help. Right. Uh, I, I think that's a question that 
uh, we seem to have skipped over for a while, but I think it uh, seems to be one of the most popular ones. Um, so it seems to be a hard data kind of question. So in your experience, how, how long uh, and what did it take for you to get your first job after, after the boot camp? How long? I think about three months. Um, and what did it take? Hmm. I think it's actually it's like, as I mentioned, uh, like all the lead code hacker ranks and um, preparing our portfolio, sending out interviews. Uh, and I guess like actually going through channels that if let's say um, that are not so conventional, at least for me, because um, I had some interviews that I got via connections, some that I got via cold emailing them, uh, and some that is like basically uh, I went to a networking event and then I got to know the person. Yeah. So I think it takes a bit more initiative on your part if it's your first job because um, I think the first job is the hardest to get. Afterwards, usually it is like you recruit, you could be like recruiters are calling on you already. Yeah. The <laughs> um, so to go a bit deeper into this, especially in today's context, right? There's uh, the news doesn't seem to have been very good recently about all the tech layoffs. So given that, um, what do you think our candidates here can do to stand out uh, in order to get hired? I think definitely uh, work on your personal projects. Have uh, a strong portfolio to show. And uh, also show your enthusiasm, um, show your passion. I think those goes a long way. And um, uh, from my experience from different interviews, uh, I find that the interviewers, they are looking for candidates uh, who have a growth mindset, uh, who are interested in continuous learning, and uh, uh, who are able to um, be, uh, be enthusiastic about taking on challenges. So um, these go a long way. Mm. Okay, the, the first part, is it harder to land a job? Yes. Um, I think the, the amount of jobs, as far as I can tell from scrolling Reddit, <laughs> is probably like, it's not the same kind of like uh, atmosphere as it was like a few years ago. And um, as to how you stand out, I guess like apart from being able to know your uniqueness and presenting it well, I think it's also for me like, um, I personally had like this like whole Excel sheet of like um, all the steps that like basically I sent out and then there was no reply and it's like a um, matter of refining like where, where did it go wrong? Is it you send that resume and then there's no response then maybe you need to refine your resume. Uh, is it that you keep feeling at like certain whiteboarding like questions or uh, was it because of the, like sometimes they will send like the hacker rank, like uh, that kind of like um, questions. Uh, it's like a um, assessment. Uh. And then is it because you feel that? So you identify your weakness and then maybe that might help. Yeah. So as from a company that had quite high profile layoffs recently, that's definitely harder, uh, even though, but I will share that those uh, the talk in actually that I've been hearing is not how to get hired, but how to find your own like side hustle and start hiring people. So I mean, the, the point being that there's definitely, I mean, each of us have a very unique set of skills, right? That is not just outside, uh, not just in tech. So I think it's definitely worth the time and effort to, to think about that rather than just like, what can you sell yourself to the company, but what can you actually create value on your own or with others? Yeah, I suppose there are a couple of us here who are from the arts uh, courses. Um, I can't speak for this, so I let our speakers uh, deal with this. Was there any difficulty in switching from an arts-based field to tech? And how would you advise someone from the arts looking to enter tech? Um, definitely, there would be a steep learning curve um, because uh, I find uh, the part of my brain in when I did my old job and my current job is quite different. 
uh, I think um, definitely writing lead code hacker rank would help. And uh, if that is uh, too difficult or takes too much time, um, break it down. So definitely is uh, taking baby steps, but um, hone that part of your brain um, where, where you do algorithm challenges, coding challenges, and start small. And uh, with every one that you accomplish, uh, it will be it will be like a dopamine to your mind. You're like, oh yes. So and and you will move on from there. So um, yeah, it's uh it's um, not easy, but it's definitely possible. Yeah, it's actually my answer will be very similar. Lah. And uh, one of the things that helped was this course called Learning How to Learn. <laughs> and uh, it sounds very stupid, but it's like, uh, it goes into like uh, strategies um, that you can take to learn new skills. And from switching to art to uh, something that is more logic-based, right? To me, it's like your brain is not used to it. Um, but you will form uh, new neural connections and your brain will adapt. So your brain is like very, very good at adapting. Um, and all of those techniques that uh, the, the course um, part, uh, I don't think I use like that much, but even like the few that I use, like, it was really uh, helpful. Yeah. Right, okay. <laughs> um... I think we're coming to some like the tail end of the questions about uh, the job hunt, and um, I suppose let's give our speakers a, a chance to do a bit of advertising for bootcamp as well, because this seems to be one of the more highly voted questions, right? Uh, would you recommend others to go for the bootcamp as well? Definitely, yes. Uh, for me, it's life changing, and um, there's no regrets. Of course. Um, there will be some fear involved, especially when you're doing something, uh, when, when you have, uh, we have been doing something for a long time, you're in your comfort zone. Uh, taking the first step out is always the hardest. And uh, it's not just your own thoughts, like coming back to you, you know, some of the negativity. It could be uh, maybe your friends or family uh, may not be that encouraging, but, um, but uh, looking back, yeah, there's no regrets. And uh, if you never try, you never know. So um, I think it's better to try than to regret not trying. For me, I think it depends. Uh, it depends on the bootcamp. It depends on your life circumstances. Uh, like I had rent to pay. Uh, I had like concerns about like, oh, if this doesn't work out, the opportunity cost of it, is it going to be okay for me to tank uh, and then of course the wider industry what's the job market like so i would say that like uh, for myself the experience was something that um was really positive uh the boot camp itself like i made lifelong friends friends uh, uh but this i think would vary from person to person and from circumstance to circumstance uh yes on that point of like that the opportunity cost is high right and so precisely because of that i think that made the bootcamp experience very uh high risk but also high return um in the sense that this whole group of 10 to 20 people all know that they gave up their jobs and like spent three months and it's a very different kind of community that i had not experienced before of is i don't I, even in school you definitely don't experience that um, I will get, give the key caveat of where the bootcamp learning style is very unique. So uh, personally, that worked fantastic for me because I did not like school. I really struggled to like sit down in the lesson and I, I, I need to see the real life application. Whereas bootcamp, if, uh, at least my bootcamp was very experiential, meaning that they don't tell you step by step how to do it. It's just like, okay, go and do it one week, go and build your own thing. I huh? don't know how, so Google, Google your way. But I really enjoy that kind of learning and thrived in it. But I know that it might be difficult for others who prefer more structured, like okay, step by step, uh, this is how you learn it. So yeah, two factors of uh, mm -hmm. high risk, high return, as well as um, learning style. So there's a lot of good stuff about boot camps, right? But there's a, actually another question about boot camps as well, about you know, after you talk about all the good stuff, then what are the possible limitations of, of boot camps. Um, what do we think? 
<laughs> okay, so uh, yes, uh, if anyone is in school, please stay in school. I'm not telling you, <laughs> but I did wrestle during my like two years of uni or four years of uni, right? And I really weighed it out. But and my personal evaluation is that the book can really condenses the learning. Um, it condenses a learning because for the four year degree, right? You're doing one semester. I can do the math mm -hmm. every 12 weeks, you have one hour of lesson that is equivalent to ultimately the boot camp two days, right? So if you take that whole semester course, it's actually only two days of boot camp. Uh, that's it. I will, the CS degree the, is a much broader scope. And how I, and how I like try to explain it to my parents was like, you use a calculator, right? The book can teach you how to use the calculator to do interesting, useful stuff. Uh, the CS degree teaches you how the calculator works. Like you go inside and like all the bits and bytes, which in the end you might never ever need to know. Uh, it's useful, but like, uh, <laughs> so it's just very different. Uh, I, I for me, I, I really, I personally, I enjoyed the book camp and learned a lot there because mostly because of the learning style, um, but the scope of scope of curriculum. Uh, that is debatable and in fact now there's a lot of uh, online courses that you can design your own curriculum. Um, there's actually a question about salary ranges which uh, we feel would probably be more suited for the networking session later. Um, some sensitivity, sensitivities we're talking about salaries in such a setting uh, so I hope you understand um, but yeah feel free to ask us later on at the networking session, I think we can move on to you know from the the job hunt into what's what is it actually like to work as a software engineer. Uh, we've spoken a little bit about this earlier on, but you know there's a very hot topic uh, in recent years, especially with the pandemic, right? Like how do you prevent burn burnout? Um, so what what kind of lessons uh, would you all be able to? Uh, what kind of advice would you all be able to offer to our audience here to, today? I think sleep is underrated. <laughs> yeah. Caffeine will only bring you so far. Uh, and it's true, um, there are many, many times where I have uh, a story, a Jira ticket to fulfill uh, a feature. And uh, I just cannot wrap my head around it. I cannot get it working perfectly. And um, I've been at the computer for like four hours straight. But I thought, okay, I'll just go take a walk. Go take a walk and come back and ah so uh, that's just one example or another time will be when when you're drifting to sleep and the answer just come to you or the next morning when you sit at a computer again with your brain fresh uh, uh, the answers come so yeah uh, have some sleep and have some rest for me it's um when you get the job right <laughs> if possible get one where that's good work like balance. Because I, I guess like um part of it is like burnout, it can be self-imposed, uh, where you are doing it to yourself. La. Like basically your company is like, oh, it's fine, you don't have to, you can go home now. But then you still want to like solve uh the issue and uh you still want to continue working. Um the other one is like I don't think it's it's quite hard not to burn out when the work culture like facilitates burnout um unless you're very very disciplined like you knock off at on time uh and you can separate work and life uh for me i know i can't because like the last the the that time when there was a pandemic uh i spent uh like the whole day in my room and i forgot that oh it's early after work it's like 8, 8 p.m i won't have dinner yet so uh one advice for myself is I go to the office so that there's a segregation. Yeah. yeah. Uh, my, or rather, okay, I would say I have suffered burnout on two, like two more serious seasons. One was straight after my first job as a software engineer, but also I was very young, so didn't know, so didn't know how to handle like working. Uh, and so that's why I thought I went to uni. And then second was also after I came back to Singapore, but also tied with other like personal family taking care of caregiving. Um, and so that's why I took the break, uh, like two year break from tech completely. And the lessons that I learned was that 
uh, is really better to prevent burnout than just than going there and it's much much harder to return from there but also the very crucial lesson was that every yes means many no's so everything you say yes you we keep just keep saying yes right but then we don't think uh, we don't think that there's a lot of no's that go behind each yes and so if uh, one thing I really struggled with the linking to the hustle culture uh, culture next is that the tech industry feels like oh there's something new to learn every day right I remember even in a boot camp I had this super long document of everything every blog post that I wanted to read uh, it's now seven eight years after that I've still not read all those blog posts and I don't think I'll ever get to that but then yeah I did I have said certain yeses, and that means that these blog posts will unfortunately be no's. And so just being very aware that we are finite, time is finite, and just weighing, weighing that trade-off is uh, has been very useful to me. Yeah, I think the part about discipline is really important. But uh, early on, I think Hui Tian mentioned something about um, sometimes the culture sort of like makes it easy to burn out, uh, especially if you are in such a company uh the nine to nine kind so you know is how prevalent is this uh do you all see in in tech um i'll speak for um my team there is no hard and fast rule um you're free to knock off on time but of course uh you are responsible for your own work and sometimes uh, if you have a feature that, uh, that needs to be released uh, next month so it's it's up to you uh, to be responsible to deliver it and um, also sometimes um, uh, your work may be uh, may be a dependent from uh, for another team member example the tester is waiting for your feature to be finished so he can test so that adds a bit of uh, extra um, extra pressure or extra um, urgency to complete uh, your story yeah uh, and uh, aside from that maybe i'll just touch on this um if you are involved in deployment so deployment where uh the rest of singapore sleeps but the Im uh, important features are rolled out and uh, you are involved in testing it th uh, that wouldn't be during the nine to nine it would be probably like 12 to 3 a.m yeah so just something to keep in mind yeah, I agree about the the part where you are on call. I think it depends on your company, your job role. Uh, certain jobs, I see my DevOps uh, in my team, they will have to be on call because they are the ones, who, if let's say um, things go down, they are the ones who have to be at the front lines to resolve them. Uh, for my own experience in three companies, so far it hasn't been 9 to 9. Uh, it's uh, usually... In most cases, actually, I, I feel like um, my superiors will be like telling me, oh, please knock off now. Like, it's already six. Let's go off. <laughs> yeah. So, so I think like other than that, my other book came classmate is like, in general, I feel like the tech um, work culture tends to be more lax in terms of the time. Like you can uh, come in late uh, and knock off on time or even early if you have finished your work. Um, whereas in my previous job, uh, because there were hard deadlines, like it has to be printed, um, sent to the print shop by this hour, we have days where we ha we will just uh, not sleep for 24 hours just to um, deliver the, the stuff, which I have not encountered in uh, tech yet. And I hope I don't. <laughs> yeah. So the hours, I feel, is a more surface level question, but the deeper level question behind this is how do you deal with the hustle culture, uh, right? And really back to back to our values and deciding what what we want to pursue. If the certain odd hours like might work for certain people, let's say with family commitments and all that, or let's say in my company now it's a global company, right? So sometimes we have to call like different countries, work with them quite often. Uh, so in that sense, yes, I agree. Tech does have quite that flexibility, and therefore the ownership comes to each individual to decide how we want to uh, navigate this. Whether you're hustling or not, like it's really down to what you value and how you want to spend your time. Okay, um, I think 
in the interest of time, because there's uh, there's a networking session after this, but I think um, there are a couple of really useful questions for audience, mainly about career paths. Uh, since we've been out in the, in the industry for a while, um, how would you chart your career path? Uh, that's one. And probably also a related question is uh, when you switch jobs in tech, I mean, charting your career path is, you plan your, your career path, right? But when you actually switch jobs, then what were the skills? What skills do you bring from one job to another that that helps that le uh, that you can learn that enables that that jump? Yeah, so two for one question, right? Okay, then then shall go first. Um, my first job actually was uh only front end, because um that was like something that was easier to pivot to, uh, and that was the best offer I got, and then um. Afterwards, like uh, basically with each jump, um, I guess my skill set and the uh, stuff that I learned broadened. So like my next job, there was like uh, it was a full stack role, front end, back end, a little bit of DevOps, and then now basically it's uh also full stack with a bit of DevOps and um a bit of like a feature leading uh where we get to uh do um some like a little bit of like a taste of like being a business analyst uh, and I think uh, each job hop definitely I bought a lot from the previous job uh, because each job um, whatever I learned it was like okay there was this base of foundation already and then um, there was something that I else that I was interested in and then they were like okay we, 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 uh, since you had this uh that's good the, uh you know this programming language uh, okay yeah, we know that you can contribute um and you're interested in learning uh, back end for instance then uh that's what we need so uh and that's what i look for because i wanted something that um i could experience like the end to end of the uh software development yeah uh, okay uh, hmm what's the previous question <laughs> Uh, previous question, how will you chart your career path? Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, so I think I learned like what I didn't want to do. So right from the bootcamp, I knew that, okay, coding is cool. I can do it, but I don't really foresee myself doing it 24 seven or long term. And it was very clear, right? Cause there are some bootcamp people that want to code all day, all night. Like they go home, they're like, yes, I can code. And for me, it's like, no, I want to close the computer. But I, I, that's where I, I still started out as a software engineer, right? And learn in a product company, owning the end-to-end -end of a product. And like, that was very cool to have, to know that every single code change you make, like really influences the product and customers. But thereafter that, I went to a second job. Um, and that's where I realized that I'm good at killing projects. So the story was that like two months into building this thing, I was hired as a contract. Uh, developer and then they had this grand like plan like phase one phase two phase three phase four and we were at phase one and then at to the two months mark i saw their phase four goal and I'm like why are we even building phase one like phase one doesn't help anything like i can get you to phase four with an excel sheet so it was a very awkward like team meeting with the boss there and then the next week the team was disbanded and then i was asked to work on the excel sheet <laughs> So that data point for me was uh, showed or like helped me understand that hey maybe my skill set I'm not I'm not the my most valuable skill set is not necessarily just coding but really seeing the bigger business context and like identifying what's the fastest or most efficient way to solve the business outcomes. So that influenced my subsequent subsequent experiences that I wanted a bit more like overview role rather than a full on hands on coding. And that's uh, more of what I do now as a solutions architect. So the point being, and I not and not everyone might relate to my journey, but the point being that everyone has their own uh, likes and dislikes, unique experiences and skill sets. So definitely use that to cut, uh, chart your career path, and also find out what you don't like. So my answer to that is uh, on the contrary. Uh, I find that the more I code, the more I love it. <laughs> and uh, so, so for me, uh, it will be a bit different. Uh, I would like to go uh, more in depth into it. So now it has been about two years and um, 
the the journey of um, coding um, at, with best practices and learning uh, the new frameworks and uh, design patterns and putting it into your everyday uh, job. I, I find it's very fulfilling. And, uh, and uh, on top of it, now uh, we have some freshers. Uh, that's what my Indian colleagues call them, freshers. Uh, they're fresh out of boot camp or, or university. And uh, I find it very fulfilling also to guide them. And so it's not all just uh, coding. It's like, hey, how do you merge this branch with this branch? And, and uh, how do you change your Jenkins file so that you can pass this view? You know, things like that. Yeah. So yeah, for me, it will be uh, going more in depth. Right. Um, I think you can all hear the noise. So before we break off for the networking session, I think, uh, do we have any last words we want to piece of uh, last piece of advice to our audience here? Any last words? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, before they start hammering the place down, right? So, Not that kind of last words. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, like no. closing words, sorry. Yeah, clo closing words, closing thoughts. Closing thoughts. Uh, well, uh, having been on a mid-career change, uh, I would say it wasn't easy. And also coming from a non-conventional uh, background to something more logical, um, it, it wasn't easy, but it's definitely doable. So uh, my words of encouragement would be um, put in the hours. You definitely need to, uh, at least at the start. And uh, don't give up. And uh, when you find it being lonely, uh, you know, coding and learning alone, uh, talk to someone. There are many like-minded uh, people here in Junior Dev, and I'm sure in uh, all the other meetups as well. So yeah, don't give up. I'd like to quote one of my um, colleagues. Uh, he always say this, uh, in every, almost every grooming, stay curious. Um, I think it's like, after your first job, you'll be like, okay, I have already uh, learned all of this. And then like I'm at a with time you get comfortable. Yeah. So it's hard to give you yourself a push of like, oh, I need to question why things are this way. And then uh if you see like things that you don't understand in the code base, uh don't just ignore it. Like um really take a look at it. Really go and uh question why things are this like this and then um look deeply into things yeah um mine would be that every day you might feel like you do, don't know a lot and it's very overwhelming uh but you won't know any you won't know less than what you know now so even though you feel very like wow i don't know even now I, every day i'm like wow i don't know anything but just look at the journey you've come and yeah you, you definitely learn a lot and just keep growing um the second thing is yeah really community is your greatest asset so the people around here and other, other meetup groups you all have this very unique perspective of yeah um, trying something new entering a new industry so it's community is a great asset okay yeah um so i guess that's it for the q a for the ama part um after this i think we'll have a networking session we'll still be around uh, hopefully this doesn't get worse uh, it might um but yeah so there are quite a number of other questions here that we can't cover uh within this span of time feel free to stick around and ask us uh we'll still be around but for now uh let's thank our speakers for today